All right. Uh, if you haven't been here in here uh, in a while, we are, have started something new here, and so because of Jen's announcement, we have lit the candle for people coming to Christ. Right. And so our prayer, our prayer is that we would light this candle every week. But our hope, actually, for that young. Uh, young uh, man is that he would go all the way in, right? And so we rejoice in that. We celebrate that. We celebrate each soul uh, that enters of, uh, into the light from the darkness, right? Uh, the scripture says that uh, heaven rejoices. The angels sing when somebody comes to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so we celebrate that uh, this morning. Well, we've been in a series here at Newbridge over the past few weeks where we have been looking at the effects or the aftermath, as we've been calling it, of the resurrection. And we've been asking questions like, how did it change the world? How did the resurrection impact followers of God at that moment? And how does it impact all of us today? Well, today we're going to look in some detail at a powerful section from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, that speak directly to the aftermath or the impact of the resurrection in his own life. Now, let me just point out for a moment that so far over the past few weeks, we've looked at moments in the immediate aftermath of the resurrection recorded in the Gospels, but today's message is quite different. And why that is, is, well, the, first off, the letter that Paul uh, wrote to the Philippians was some 30 years after the resurrection. And so in those weeks, after Christ died uh, and was raised from the dead, where was Paul? Well, the apostle Paul at that moment was still called Saul uh, at that point, and he was not a follower of Jesus. He was quite the opposite, actually. He was a persecutor of the people of the way, as the Christians were called at that point in history, and yet the resurrection would have a dramatic impact on his life, so much so that he wrote most of the New Testament, right? And not just Paul's life, of course, but the resurrection, I need you to know this, the resurrection still has an impact and a life-changing hope for you and me today. In fact, uh, our text today would not have been written if not for the resurrection. Well, how did the resurrection impact Paul? We, we don't have time to really unpack his conversion on his way to Damascus. I certainly have mentioned that uh, previous times here at Newbridge. But in short, Paul joins with many others that saw the risen Christ. This is one of the keys, uh, if you know about what it, what it takes to be an apostle, one of the key experiences that all apostles share. They had to see the risen Christ. And so this is generally, now I say generally because some people still do it, don't, we don't call people apostles today. Uh, someone might have an apost apostolic gifting, which means they, they're maybe a church planter or they have a vision for the mission to expand the kingdom of God, for the gospel to go forward. Uh, but we no longer have, technically, we no longer have apostles. Now, side note, if I uh, start calling myself Apostle Reverend Tim Daniels, that might be your cue to find another church. <laughs> But I won't do that, I promise. Now, we're in Philippians chapter 3 today, where Paul is emphasizing the power of the resurrection and how that power has changed his life. And not just in a, a small way, but, but completely changed his life. Join with me uh, as we're in Philippians 3, starting in verse 1. My brothers and sisters and sisters rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The flesh. Now, this becomes important as he moves forward. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence... If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. And that's a bold claim. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, today we're going to spend the majority of our time honing in on those last two verses. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul emphasizes here in this passage, really, what we might say is the other side of the resurrection. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to consider the theological truth or, or the doctrine of the resurrection, you might say that it was an historical event, right? A fact or a point in history that we can look back on and say this happened. And it's, that's absolutely true. And this is why it's included in the creeds. Some of you uh, grew up memorizing the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed reads, Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. And similarly, the Nicene Creed says, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures. Now, those creeds were written so that the church and really everyone else in the world were clear on what the church held to be true. What they're saying is this happened, and this is the foundation upon which we build our theological understanding, our spiritual understanding of, of God. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I'm dating myself, but Dragnet, well, that's before me. <laughs> just the facts, ma'am, right? We just want the facts, right? And that's what those creeds are. These facts provide the foundation for Christian theology. And when it comes to the resurrection in the scripture, we see the Apostle Paul uh, support this fact. In 1 Corinthians, now I'm going to mention that a couple times today, 1 Corinthians, many scholars and theologians say, is the de facto chapter on the resurrection. If you want to know about the resurrection, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul details it very clearly. Uh, but he also records there that he appeared not just to the remaining 11 uh, disciples, but more than... 500 people. Now, if uh, you had wondered in those days whether it happened, and over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ, this is why the church was able to be born and go forth. This is why so many would lose their life because they saw Jesus with their eyes. Right? This is the birth of the church. Now, you might be here today or you might be tuning in online and not believe any of that historically. But this has always been a declaration of the church. What the gospel writers and the other authors of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are recording is that the resurrection happened. That Jesus rose from the dead. It's a fact as far as they are concerned because they are counted in the number of people who encountered the resurrected Christ. It's a very important basis of our faith, indeed all of Christianity. But what is interesting here in our text for today in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is not arguing that it's a fact per se, as he does in 1 Corinthians 15. 
What he's saying is that the resurrection is, that, is something that not only can be known factually, but it's something that can be personally experienced. Let me say that again. The resurrection is something that not only can be known factually or intellectually, but it is something that can be personally experienced. And there's a difference between the two. If we want to understand the impact or the aftermath of the resurrection, we have to seek both. We have to seek both. You see, if we have one but not the other, we are missing out on its full impact. One without the other is like a car without any fuel, gas or electric. Right? We can faithfully know that the car has the potential to move, but without the fuel, without power, we cannot realize or understand or relish in its potential. Are you with me? Are you tracking my uh, train of thought here? So the resurrection can be known factually and experientially. There are two sides of the same coin. And as I've already pointed out already, we can, take a, we can look at places like 1 Corinthians 15 or the gospel accounts, as well as various extra biblical documents that all point to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And it's super important, but it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. But conversely, we can also say that we have had a spiritual experience but not really believe the resurrection actually happened. And that misses the mark as well, doesn't it? Now, this might just be me, but in my mind, and the way my mind works, the fact tends to build on the experience. But it can really go the other way, right? You, you understand the fact, you say, okay, Jesus rose from the dead at this point in history, and now I'm going to investigate this more. I'm going to look into it more and press into or live into or step into this spiritual experience. I've probably belabored the point here, but I simply want to say to us today, if we've never felt the impact of the resurrection in our lives, if we haven't experienced a personal spiritual renewal that is made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then what Paul is referring to here is how you can find yourself practicing a religion that is merely ritualistic, lacking real transformative power. And isn't this how Paul lived his life of faith before he came to Christ? Right? I want to illustrate it this way. I don't know if there's any Downton Abbey fans out there. Any down, show of hands? Okay. Oh, wow. I guess maybe it's gone down in popularity. Well, the Daniels house was a little late to the start watching this show. I think we probably uh, picked up watching in the third, maybe fourth season or so. But we gave it a try to see what the fuss was about, and we were hooked. And we, like many of you, have seen all the episodes and the two movies. Uh, hopefully, maybe a third will come out. We played catch up, but we're glad we did. Now, my family uh, will tell you that, uh, for me, costume dramas aren't really my thing. In fact, what, I'm, where's Abby? What did we just watch recently? Pride and Prejudice? She's been asking me for 20 years, Daddy, would you watch Pride and Prejudice? Well, maybe 15. And I'm like, no, no, no. I finally, I cried the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, but it's generally not my thing. Uh, but, but, um, but I remember as I watched the show being struck by the beauty of the castle. Here's a picture of the castle. The beauty of the castle. It's, but which, by the way, it's still a castle called High Clear, and there's still a British earl and his wife that live there. But I can remember during the opening credits or as they transition from scene to scene, cutting to the beautiful shots of, of the castle and thinking to myself, how can a place this beautiful and grand still exist? They're literally, I mean, as you see the big shots, there's no neighbors. All you can see is an enormous structure set on acres and acres of beautiful English countryside, over 5,000 acres to be exact. Now, the truth, now follow me here. The truth is this place exists. I knew this in my mind. But it was a completely another thing to go there and to see it. 
And a few weeks ago, my family and I had the privilege of visiting the castle, and it was everything I expected it would be and more. To be there to experience the beauty, not just of the architecture, but more importantly, the beauty of the location. That's what always mesmerized me. And it brought it to the next level for me. Now, does it make sense what I'm saying? Not only did I know such a place existed, but I got to experience it. I got to smell the grass. I got to feel the wind, to sit on the chair in the yard uh, that as you look off into the woods, that so many, for you fans, that so many shots were, were shot in. I even gave my bride a kiss there and had the kids take a picture. Uh, absolutely breathtaking. Now I knew the fact that this place existed and I experienced it firsthand. So my question for you today, as it relates to the most important reality, is in the aftermath of the resurrection, do you know the resurrection not simply just as a fact, but as an experience to be lived into. Do you know them both? Because they're both important. Do you think it was an actual historical event? And have, had, have you had a deep personal experience with it? You see, Christianity doesn't fit nearly neatly into one category. It's not solely a product of the right brain or the left brain. It's not only about rationality, nor is it purely about mysticism. It encompasses both the mystery and, 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 and factual truth. Christianity uh, emphasized uh, that it's not just a mere beliefs or propositions or ethics. Those don't bring about life transformation. You have to experience God. You have to know him. And so the flip side, to be clear, is that we have to believe the facts as well. Those are very important. And I pointed this out last week that Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, states uh, that if we don't uh, have a factual understanding of the resurrection, our faith and our preaching, he says, is meaningless. It's useless. So here in Philippians 3, Paul says, and I'll state it for you again, I want to know him. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. Now, it's, it's important here to take everything Paul said just prior to this statement into consideration. That's why I read it. Uh, what, does he, what does he do there? He, he essentially reads the Philippian church, and by extension us, his entire resume right? He says, I'm, I was the Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I studied the law. I know it backwards and forwards. I, I didn't just know it, but I obeyed it to the best of my ability. I studied, studied under the best rabbis. I have the credentials. I have the pedigree. I was raised in this. I was really someone, or so I thought. But then he says, now that I know Christ, Mm. After I was ambushed by Jesus, that's a favorite quote of mine from Brennan Manning, the uh, late priest and author. He used to say he was ambushed by Jesus. Paul is saying, now that I know Jesus, now as I consider all of my credentials, my resume, and all of the things that I aspired towards, all those things, he says, are trash. Amen. They're rubbish. Compared to what? To the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Amen. Paul's saying, it's not that I'm not proud of my accomplishments. It's not that I am not proud of my identity or my, or my uh, 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 cultural or ethnic heritage. Those things are, are great, but all of those things pale in comparison to knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. He's saying, this is my sole focus. This is what I'm all about, to know Jesus and his resurrection. You see, being a follower of Jesus goes well beyond just agreeing with certain beliefs. And those things are important. Doctrine is important 
If we don't have sound doctrine, we have, we're on shaky ground. But it's much more than that. It means considering all else in our lives in some ways insignificant compared to the ultimate goal of knowing Christ and experiencing the power of his resurrection. And I wonder this morning, do you have the same passion as the Apostle Paul? Do you have the same way of thinking? Or do I have that same passion? Do we know him? Do we want to know him? Here's the thing. Do you know that it is possible to know all sorts of things about the Bible, all sorts of facts and details. Maybe you know the original languages. It's possible to know all sorts of things about the Bible and Christianity, to to, to study theologians and, and get this, and to miss Jesus altogether. It's possible to know things, to study things, to research things, and in the process you miss Jesus entirely. Have you met people like that? I have. In fact, I've been one of them. Have you? And you know, it, I've already mentioned this, it sounds a lot like Paul's life before he became a follower of Jesus, right? It's exactly the same. Paul's saying, I, I've been down that road, and it is a road everyone must travel. It's important to pursue knowledge and wisdom and understanding and doctrine and theology, but that is only half of the story. And you see, the resurrection doesn't just transform our minds, although it does that, but it transforms us in our very souls because when we encounter the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, we encounter Jesus himself. And when we encounter Jesus, we are never the same. Never the same. We can't move forward from those encounters unchanged. When you come into the presence of Almighty God, when you experience him in the power of his resurrection, you are changed forever. I love how God works in my life and circumstances leading up to Sundays. He drops little morsels along the way to, I'm like, oh, that would be good for my message. He did that a few times this week. He's always speaking, always leading us. And so in my daily Bible reading this past week, uh, probably Tuesday or Wednesday, I was in John chapter 4, which as some of you know details Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. A pretty famous story. And in that story, she asks him an interesting question. She says, why do the Jews worship at the temple in Jerusalem while the Samaritans worship at a different temple on Mount Gerizim? There were two temples because at one point, if you go back in the history, they were all Jewish and then there was a split. And I love the way that Jesus answers her question. He says to her, pretty soon, meaning after my death and resurrection, it won't matter where you worship. Why? Because your body will be the temple of the Holy Spirit because you will worship God, he says, in spirit and in truth. It's spirit knowing and connecting with him, listening for his voice, following his promptings, and in truth, knowing the factual doctrinal truth of God and engaging in the study of the Bible, reading commentaries, all of that, in spirit and in truth. Now, I could unpack that more. That's worth probably a whole message or more. But I, I, are you getting the point here? It's, it's not one or the other. It's a both-end situation. Some of you might be saying this morning, I know how to study. I know how to do research, but I'm not sure how to do this experience thing. Well, let me ask you, how do we experience Jesus in his resurrection? There's a few ways. This is not a comprehensive list, but we experience him in prayer, right? Remember, prayer is supposed to be a two-way conversation. Prayer is not just gimme, 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 gimme. Or would you do this or would you do that? Or would you do all of these things for me so that I can live a better, more comfortable life? No, prayer is part of that. (laughs) Some of it anyway, what I just said. 
But prayer is also sitting quiet in the presence of God. And if you follow the Lord's prayer and the order of things, that's prayer. That, there's so much that happens before you get to gimme. Do you approach prayer that way? Do you approach God saying, God, I have nothing and you have everything. Would you pour out into me what you want to say? Would you pour down into me what you want me to do instead of me saying, here's what I want to do, Lord, and would you bless me? Oftentimes, that's how we pray. I got a plan. Jesus, I got a plan. It's a good plan. Bless it in Jesus' name. We experience God and his resurrection power by the filling of his spirit and the subsequent gifts of the spirit, which we believe here are alive and active right today. But we also believe that Jesus, by his spirit, produces fruit within us. And the outpouring of our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. We experience him, yes, by reading the Scripture that as the writer of Hebrews says, most likely Paul, he says the Scripture is dead and inactive. No, he says it's alive and active. Alive and active. We can encounter the risen Christ as we're reading the living Word of God And we can experience him as we worship him. I I had a powerful experience with Jesus in worship this past week. I was driving somewhere, I don't know where. I was listening to this new song, the first song that we did today at the beginning of the service to practice, to be ready to lead it for you. And there was a moment in the recording, it was a live recording, it was different than the one that I sent out to the team, that moved me in such a profound way. Verse 4 starts out this way with the lyrics, Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross, darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. And then there was this big moment of silence. And I was like, we got to tell the rest of the story because that's not the end, right? Heaven didn't lose. It's kind of a Good Friday moment where we're just like, what, what just happened? I don't, I'm, I'm, there's chaos. What, what's happening? And then the recording went silent, and then they got fancy. We, we don't get fancy like this here at Newbridge. They had a sound of a stone rolling away from the tomb, rumbling through the speakers. And if you know me, if you're in my car and we're listening to music, it's loud. It's at 11. And so my subwoofer was rumbling, and I was like, I was in an instant overcome with worship. Because the stone was rolled away and and then the declaration comes, but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That is the gospel, friends. That is the resurrection power of God. And in that moment, through tears, I I was overcome with joy unspeakable, with gratitude, not just the knowledge of the historicity of the resurrection, but an encounter with Jesus himself right there in my car as I was going to wherever I was going. Overwhelmed with gratitude that as I look back on my life, he took me out of the pit. He restored me from the depths. He's gracious. He's patient. He's loving and kind. That was a moment for me of encounter with the risen Christ, not just knowing but living into the experience power of Jesus and his resurrection. It's not just information, friends, but it's knowing at the very deepest recesses of our souls. And my testimony was in that moment, Lord, you saved me. You rescued me. And so I want to ask you this morning as we close, have you experienced Jesus in this way? Are you living into the resurrection and not just learning about it? And the last thing that I want to do here in this space, preaching, is just give you a bunch of information and, and, and have that be it. I want you to experience the power of the resurrection in your life. Following God is not just about knowing him. It's it's about being changed by him. So for those of you today that profess Jesus as Lord, do you have the attitude of Paul here in Philippians 3 
or are you distracted? You know, one of the things for me this week is I was really convicted and I had to confess sometimes my focus is divided. Anybody have divided focus in here in 2024? With the barrage of information and noise and chaos that comes our way, it is harder to be a follower of Jesus today than it ever has been probably in the history of humankind. So much is coming at us. And as I look at the things, some of the things are good things. Some of the disciplines are good things. But as I consider them, I, I, I echo with Paul, I consider those things rubbish compared to the, to the knowledge of, of, the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I battle like the rest of you to keep him the focus of my life. Now hear me now. I don't want to lay a religious burden on you. This is not prescriptive. I'm not saying this is how you encounter God. But I want us all to encounter him, to pursue him with, uh, with wild abandon. And I know for me, and probably for some of you, there are some things that as you, look at, uh, as you look at your life, as I look at my life, I probably could put some of those things to the side to enable that encounter to, uh, to happen, to make space for God, to make room for God as we sing sometimes. And sometimes because we are still in the process of becoming like Christ, we dip back into our old ways, don't we? That's the human struggle. We are imperfect, but thank God he's patient and kind, full of grace and steadfastness. He is committed to us even when we stumble. I want you to all hear that again. Look, look at me right in my eyes. Even when you stumble, he is patient with you. And he loves you. And he doesn't stop pursuing you. He's running after you. I believe that's why you're here today. So let me say it one more time. I want to know the Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Don't you? My hope this morning as we close is that if you feel like there's something you need to get off your chest, if, there's, if, you, if you feel like there's something you need to confess, or if, there's, if you just want to come forward for prayer, we always have a solid team here ready to pray for you. If you are sick, we want to pray for healing. We have an oil, and we want to anoint you with oil. Come. This space is sacred space. In fact, we put an extra row of chairs here and we took it out. It was too close. We needed some space for people to be prayed for, and so we took it out, and we're just trusting that God will make space for all of the people that want to come to Newbridge. Um, but I invite you forward this morning. Join with me in that pursuit of knowing God, just not informationally, not just rationally, but knowing and experiencing his power. Amen?